Good evening. Uh, my name is Ralph Tate. I'm one of the several representatives of the Kestrel Land Trust that's here this evening. Um, for those of you who don't know, Kestrel is a regional land trust. I think many of you have may have even had dealings with us. We've been very active in Hadley as, uh, in farm preservation uh, at Mount Warner and other places. Uh, I'm a member of the Kestrel Board and, and their treasurer currently. I've been asked to start the meeting to describe the problem that we all face concerning the Lake Warner Dam. In late 2012, the Massachusetts Department of Dam Safety issued to us an order requiring us to either repair or remove the Lake Warner Dam by the end of 2014. Because we have neither the money nor the expertise to be the long-term holder of this dam, we've embarked on a process of deciding how to decide which of these alternatives to pursue. This meeting is part of that process. Now we are very aware of the impact that any activity around the dam will have on Hadley. You will hear from later speakers that there are very solid arguments behind both of the alternatives, both removal and repair. And while it is, as the owner, Kestrel's decision to make which alternative we follow, we have concluded that the importance of the Lake Warner to Hadley is such that it's appropriate to give the town of Hadley a chance to control the future of the dam and therefore the lake by taking ownership. Tonight we're going to talk about what ownership, what taking ownership might mean for the town and about what the impact of removal might be should the town decide not to take ownership. What I'd like to emphasize is that we are facing real deadlines and that we all need to continue to work to answer as many questions as we can so that the town can make its decision in October on as fully informed a basis as possible. Um, I'm not going to hand the meeting over to Sarah LaCour, who is going to talk about the plan for this evening and the presentations and discussions and give you an outline of, of what's going to go on this evening. Sarah? Thanks, Ralph. I'm a little shorter. I don't know how to do this. There we go. I'll just stand on my tippy toes. Um, so thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, as Ralph outlined, it's uh, an informational meeting. The purpose of the meeting is essentially to outline various information about the two options, repair and removal, and to hear, to, to sort of brainstorm from you, your perceptions, your thoughts on both the pros and cons of each of those two options. Uh, after you, you, you receive the information from the experts we've brought in, um, just that we want to hear your, your thoughts um, on both options. And, and think about also any questions or additional information that's needed in the future uh, and talk about what, what some of the next steps are going to be from here. Um, one of the, the key uh, pieces in this puzzle, as Kristen will outline to you later in the timeline, is heading towards town meeting and perhaps that the ownership of the dam moves from Kestrel to the town and um, how that might look and, and happen. Um, so this evening's events, uh, we're going to have an overview regarding repair of the dam by engineer Morris Root from Root Engineering, who has been hired by Kestrel to do a, a preliminary, preliminary analysis of that for us. Uh, that report is due out in, in the end of May, but he has some good information to share at this time. Uh, removal of the dam, we have uh, two women with us. Uh, one from American Rivers and one from Massachusetts Department of uh, Dam Removal, who will, will have a video and also then some information from them regarding that. Then the plan is to break out into small groups uh, at sort of corners of the room, and at that time we're just going to, the facilitator will write down everybody's thoughts. Uh, there's no wrong answers here, it's just whatever you're thinking about um, the pros of repair, the cons of repair, the pros of removal, the cons of removal. And again, that's where we'll jot down to if there's uh, questions that need to be answered. The uh, speakers will also be floating, so perhaps they can answer at the time. If not, we will make sure we write it down and get you additional information at, a, at another time. 
And then we'll come back as a, as a large group and just go over what we found out in the, those breakout groups, the facilitator will overview, and we'll have a quick, quick discussion and then next steps in terms of where Kestrel is planning to go in this process and the timeline for, for how, to, how to get there. Um, so just a little bit of context, I'm sure many of you are familiar with a lot of these details, uh, living in Hadley and, and being very familiar with the dam. Uh, but its historical significance uh, on Lake Warner is the original, it's about 66 acres, uh, Lake Warner. It was uh, a man-made lake dammed up uh, earliest in the 17th century. The current dam is, uh, dates from 1919. Uh, but actual uh, power there ceased operation in, the, uh, in 1960. The dam holds back uh, the Mill River, which the headwaters come down from Shutesbury and Leverett, Massachusetts. It winds its way through North, North Amherst, down along the western edge of the UMass campus, and then down and hits Lake Warner and, and, and then heads out to the, to the Connecticut River. Um, but it, the... <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, so the, the lake is an impoundment of, of the Mill River. And um, even though the lake at this time is suffering from eutrophication at various times in the winter or spring uh, when there's more water in it or it's frozen, I know th there are uh, recreational uses of, of the lake and uh, there's a lot of um, types of things that, that happen there, activities that happen there and also just its, its landscape significance as an historic, cultural, and scenic uh, landscape is important. One of the particular things we want to make sure everybody understands tonight is that this is an a, a informational session forum for the dam. Uh, we understand there are issues with the lake, and we understand that repair of the dam is a particular option at this time. Repairing the dam does not solve any problems within the lake. Uh, that's a different topic. Uh, I'm sure it will come up in the breakout sessions, which is fine. And we, we write it down and, and because it's, it's certainly a very important issue to consider. But in terms of what we're dealing with tonight, we're just you know, discussing repair as an option and not how to fix the lake or, or particularly deal with the lake water issue. So what I'd like to do at this time is have uh, Morris Root. He's an engineer from Vermont. He's been, as I said, working on the repair option for um, looking at the feasibility of that for Kestrel. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, just for some of you who don't know what root engineering is, I'll just say that she introduced me as coming from Vermont. I've been doing work in designing repairs for dams, I want to say decades. I've worked with the Department of Conservation and Recreation for more than 20 years. Um, how many people here have gone to Vermont? Just a show of hands. <laughs> okay. Another show of hands. How many of you have gone to Weston, Vermont? Okay. Anybody pay attention to the mill dam in Western Vermont? Did not. Somebody did. Okay. Well, anyhow, if it's featured in some of the tourist brochures for the state of Vermont. I just thought I'd introduce that. Meanwhile, um, <clears throat> I'm here because I think most people have at least just three questions when they start talking about repairing the dam. What will it look like when it's repaired? What will it cost? What needs to be fixed? Now, different people may be asking those questions in different orders, but you know, some people say fix it and I don't care about the cost, and some people say, well, let's not worry about that, but you know, let's deal with the cost first. So meanwhile, what will it look like? That's the easy question. When you get done, it's basically going to look like similar to what it is today. In large part because this is on the National Historic Register, and anything that's done is going to have to be approved by the Massachusetts Historic Commission. As simple as that. Now we'll see if I know how to make this machine work. So the next question is, what needs to be fixed? To answer those questions, I've been contracted by the Kestrel Land Trust to go through what the Office of Dam Safety calls a phase two investigation. 
one of the issues we face is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the documentation as far as the plans and how the structure was actually built are, are lacking. So we need to go out there now and basically document on the ground how this dam is put together and pay attention in detail as to what's going on. So we have various questions to deal with. We go out and take a close look, which is pretty superficial. Then we start pounding around trying to dig things out of the archives. Then we take a look at the foundation. For an earth embankment dam, we get more technical. In this case, it's pretty obvious this dam is founded on ledge. Anybody that's been there, you can see that. We're going to do a topographic survey here in a couple of weeks when the water levels get down. We'll take a look at the structural details, and then we do some evaluation as to how capable it is for passing floods, and then prepare an alternate report as to what we need to deal with. Over the years, various engineers have looked at the dam, and they've come up with a number of things that they think should be looked at in detail. <clears throat> the Office of Dam Safety hates trees. <laughs> so we've got to deal that, and it's an auto almost automatic gig. If I do an inspection report, I'm supposed to report a dam if it has trees as being in poor condition. There's some leakage at the right abutment, I'll explain. The right abutment is as in, you have to become an engineer now, and you're looking downstream. It'd be the right-hand side or the north side of the river. The side, okay. So you have some leakage coming through some of the old stonework. There's a gate over there that doesn't work. Um, and then there's some question about, well, no question, in fact, about one of the walls. Let me take a quick walk around the dam here quickly. Um, the concrete's falling off the old stonework in the spillway. And then there's some other issues with the concrete work on the um, south side of the river. Now I'll try to make the pointer work. I think everybody knows where the dam is. <laughs> when I say the right-hand side, I'm referring to that area. Where, where the gate's located and we have a wall over in here that's about ready to fall down. Uh, some of the concrete is peeling off the face of the spillway and then we have a couple of walls around these buildings here that need to be replaced or repaired. Um, okay, looking at the downstream side, this doesn't stand out quite as well as I'd hoped for, but the wall that we're worried about in here you can actually see uh, it's almost a natural arch. There's a hole right through it. Uh, and then we have places where it's peeled off here, and I'll just jump ahead. And then here are the cursed trees that are growing in here that we need to deal with. Uh, looking at the right abutment from a different perspective. That wall that I was referring to. Now we got leakage coming at us in two different forms, which are not really that visible. Some is just coming through the stonework, and some is coming out of the gate. The operator for the old gate is right up in this location. This is just a little closer to the spillway. You can see in here, uh, concrete does erode. The concrete over here is peeling off. We're imagining that this is a stone masonry dam, and that at one time, whether it's 1947 or 1919, that this was like a concrete overcoat was put on it. So we're thinking that for the most part, we're thinking that you know this is very preliminary. We need to do the analysis, but the, from the gut, thinking that the structure is stable and it's more like putting an overcoat on it with some good, uh, good concrete. On the other hand, then we get a little concerned when we get over to the other side. You can see here uh, where the concrete, and especially with the freeze-thaw action, where the water freezes, it expands and it pushes out the concrete. So we got some other issues in here. Um, okay, and then the wall that we're primarily concerned about here would be in this location, just upstream of this little house, and along here, which is the wall that was featured in the previous photograph. Interestingly, this portion of this gentleman's house, the small building here, actually has been constructed in a way where it can be lifted off and out of the way if we need to do work on the dam. You pick it up and move it with a crane. So, I mean, this is a quick overview. We have trees to take care of, the failing concrete wall, a whole bunch of concrete to deal with, some gates to replace. What I'll do is just leap ahead to um, 
And this is a very preliminary guess. You know, how can I come up with a number without doing the analysis? But meanwhile, uh, this is from experience. On one hand, I'm imagining that at the low end, we're looking at $300,000 for the total project for the budget. Perhaps up to 500,000 if we find ourselves literally having to demolish and completely replace some of the retaining walls. And the report going to the Kester Land Trust should be finished towards the end of the month of May. And then of course you have to move ahead to see, well, how does this project develop and how many permits do you need? Um, the phase two analysis is a report. This does not include design documents. It does not include specifications. It's a step towards moving towards the engineering or, or the final project. So the, back to the purpose of this meeting, in October, there's going to have to be a vote. We're going to fix the dam or not. Following that, that vote, then the engineering would be done. You do the engineering, then you move into the permits. And for those of you here from the Historical Commission, I apologize because one of the permits I did not put up there would be the project notification form that would have to go to the Massachusetts Historic Commission. But you apply for the permits, you get your permits, you bid the project, and you go into construction. So uh, that's my part of the presentation, and I guess we'll be dealing with questions and answers later. Thank you, Morris. Um, as you mentioned, we're going to deal with, we, we will have questions and, and, and discussion uh, towards the end of the, the evening when we can all come back and, and put together um, various questions for each of the, oh no, I can't see, um, the presenters. So now I'd like to introduce, um, I can't see, <laughs> Amy Singer, uh, who's from the River Restoration Program for American Rivers and Beth Lambert, who's um, with the River Restoration Program, uh, Mass Division of Ecological Resources. Thank you. Again, my name is Amy Singler. Um, I work for American Rivers and for the Nature Conservancy's Connecticut River Program. Um, I'm based uh, out here in the valley in, in Northampton. And uh, my, the bulk of my work really is on river restoration. And a certain amount of that work is working with communities and dam owners um, who want to remove their dam. Um, and there's, there's a lot that goes into dam removal and a lot that goes into those, those decisions. Um, but the primary decision that goes into dam removal is whether or not the owner wants to remove the dam or whether or not the owner chooses to remove their dam. So the kinds of projects I work on, um, I'm really providing uh, technical assistance and resources and helping find funding for these kinds of projects. But ultimately, the decision is, is always up, up, up to the dam owner. Um, and in that vein, um, what I'm going to do, I'm actually not going to talk much tonight. Um, I'm going to show about eight minutes of, um, of a short film that American Rivers has put together. We put together two different 25-minute um, films over the last 10 years that talk through some case studies of communities that chose to remove their dams. And so it's just kind of an opportunity for you to hear from, from some communities that made, that made the decision um, and, how, and how they felt about it and sort of um, their, their experience moving through the process. Again, I'm only going to show one example. Um, there's two videos, and each of them actually have, have um, three examples each. But um, this, this is just going to sort of give you kind of an overview of some of the issues and how this community made their decision. And then Beth Lambert from the Division of Ecological Restoration is going to come after me and talk a little bit more about dam removal in, in Massachusetts and, sh and show you some, some more local examples as well. So. Well, people were really vehement about not removing the dam, particularly the neighbors in the hill just up this way that overlooks the park. They felt that they were going to be losing an asset to their neighborhood. They were concerned that it was just going to be a mud hole, that there would be mosquitoes, that there would be whatever that was unattractive here. People at first were very, very skeptical of uh, what was going to happen. But of course now, uh, people know very well what's happened and, and the whole city is enjoying it.
Since the 1700s, people have built dams to provide power for our growing nation. We relied on these dams for everything from irrigating our fields, to powering our lumber and grain mills, to manufacturing our clothing. In fact, we have built on average more than one dam every day since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Today, most of the mills are gone, but the dams remain. And while many dams continue to serve important purposes, there are thousands of obsolete dams, or dams that simply cause more harm than good. These dams block our waterways across the United States, putting a financial burden on the owners and harming the health of our rivers. Many communities are learning that maintaining a questionable dam is not in their best interest that removing a dam and gaining a healthy, free-flowing river is actually a key asset for their future. Back in the late 50s, early 60s, I think it was commonplace when businesses didn't know what to do with the dam or wanted to give it up, they went to the local community and said, geez, we're going to give you this wonderful dam and to make it legal, we'll charge you a dollar for it, give us the dollar, now the dam is your responsibility. 1981, uh, we received a notice from the Department of Natural Resources that we had several problems. The average lifespan of a dam is about 50 years, and only regular maintenance and expensive repair can extend a dam's life. Many dams have gone neglected, and by the year 2020, the vast majority of our dams will be older than 50 years. This is a problem many communities can no longer afford to ignore. So what can we do when we're faced with an unsafe or obsolete dam, or one that simply causes more harm than good? Typically, there are three options. Change how the dam is operated, repair it, or remove it. We'll take a look at three communities that removed a dam when faced with this decision. South Lake Tahoe, California, Augusta, Maine, and West Bend, Wisconsin. What were their concerns? What did they gain? And most importantly, what's their advice? Well, as I recall, we were concerned about uh, that probably was nothing but mud and muck underneath, and it was not going to be something that would ever be able to be used, and it would end up being a real eyesore. Uh, they were also concerned as to who was going to take care of it and how it was going to be taken care of. So I think a lot of people were concerned about what would happen with and what the looks would be once all of a sudden we saw a mud flat piece of land uh, right in the middle of our city. I think the most important thing is to have an alternative for people to look at. What will the area be like without the dam? Will it be an asset to the community? Will it be an asset to my property if I'm a neighborhood? You've got to have that alternative vision. Together, the city and the community developed a plan for how the new land would be restored. This process helped people envision what the area would look like once the dam was removed. One thing, though, I, I need to say, though, as well, is in this conservative community, cost was a significant issue. To replace the dam with a combined dam and bridge would have been $3.3 million. And you look at $86,000 to take out the dam, plus some work to develop a park, another $200,000 to get it seated, and then continuing investments in park facilities that people could enjoy. Which are you going to get more for your money from? And when they began to weigh that, the dam and bridge combination versus no dam in a park, it became clear that the balance was in favor of putting the money in a park. Dam removal can be the logical choice for budget-conscious communities. Often repairs are more than three times as expensive as the one-time cost of removing a dam. And replacing the dam is usually even more expensive. So we saved a million eight hundred thousand dollars by not replacing the dam and we gained all of the land that was in the impoundment area which was well over 67 acres of land 
that is now usable that wasn't usable before. The area that was underwater uh, when the dam was in yet was extended all the way around onto this side here, that walkway there, all the way west to Indiana Avenue, which is a large area. While residents today can enjoy a healthy, free-flowing Milwaukee River, one that includes fishing, recreation, and clean water, when the dam was in place, it was a different story. Well, we live just on the other side of the woods over there and um, in a new subdivision down where the dam used to be. It was nothing but a just a big cesspool. People had tires in there and refrigerators and just, it was really nasty and it smelled horribly. It was bad news. Not until the dam was removed did everyone realize that they had turned bad news and a liability into good news and an asset for the whole community. They did a wonderful job. I mean, it's really made something out of nothing almost, <laughs> out of garbage. <laughs> and it's beautiful, and all the prairie flowers that are coming up, and um, all the rabbits that are hopping along <laughs> on the trails. What more would you want to see in nature? I caught a 13 and a half smallmouth bass over there. All right. Have fun? Yep. It was your first cast, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is absolutely amazing to me that we could be so blind to this wonderful asset for so many years, and I was part of it. And it you know, you don't really realize what a wonderful thing having a river flowing through your town is. So now you say to me, what does that mean when you're in business? Well, I have to recruit people to come to this town, to go to work, to come to this company. So then I could walk them down to our river and I could show them this beautiful river and kids fishing and public sculptures along the river. And I could take them to our cultural district, which is not too far from the river, and show them those things. And it's a big selling point in recruiting people to come to work for this company and in keeping them. <laughs> Getting rid of the dam and letting letting the water go through and, and uh, improving the park this way, it's, it's generally, it's a lot more useful. It's a lot more usable to, to people. There's, with the trails, is real nice and stuff. And obviously my boys love the bridges. So the whole attitude has changed. And now people want to be down, not only setting along the river, walking along the river, but they also want to even be experiencing and touching the river. And so it really is a nice benefit for the public to have. Hi there. My name is Beth Lambert, and I work for the Department of Fish and Game, Massachusetts Fish and Game, and I'm in the Division of Ecological Restoration. And um, if I can find, oh, thank you, is that the remote? So I've been asked to give you a short overview of river restoration and dam removal in Massachusetts. My division works on aquatic habitat restoration projects around this state. And this slide shows you some pictures of the type of work that we do. We focus on river restoration, freshwater wetland restoration, and salt marsh restoration. Um, our, a lot of our river restoration projects are, in fact, dam removal projects. And like Amy, I work with interested dam owners and um, communities around the state. By interested dam owners, I mean a dam owner who has made the decision that they would like to remove their dam for a variety of reasons. And so my job here tonight isn't to try to tell you to do one thing or another, but simply to provide you information uh, based on my experience working around the state. So there are about 3,000 dams in the state of Massachusetts. Each of those little red boxes on that map is a dam. And as you can see, there's a small number that are used for flood control protection. There's um, around uh, 43, 45 that are uh, hydropower dams or are certified for hydropower. And then there's um, a number of dams that are used to form drinking water supplies. So around 250 of these 3,000 dams have active ongoing purposes. The rest of the dams, for the most part, um, as you saw in the previous video, were products of the mill era. And so these are dams that were constructed in the early days of settlement to you know, saw wood, um, to mill cotton, and so on. And then later on in the Industrial Revolution, 
to power the large mills um, that you see in this area. So the mills are long since gone and shut down, but the dams remain. And this picture shows you several dams in Massachusetts. Um, and these are actually all dams whose owners decided to remove them. So because most of these dams were built so long ago, over time they have really come to deteriorate and need significant repairs. And so when a dam needs significant repairs and those repairs are expensive, that's often when a dam owner starts to look at whether it's in their best interest to own and maintain a dam into the long term. We found through experience, and these are just some examples from around the country, um, that it can cost less to remove a dam than to repair a dam. Each dam is unique, and so each repair cost really depends on the current status of that dam. Um, you heard a little bit about the Lake Warner Dam and the expected cost to repair that. And similarly, each dam is unique, and so the cost to remove the dam depends on the complexity of the project. So these are just examples of, of typical costs um, for dam removal and repair that we've seen around the country. So as I said, as dams in Massachusetts have been deteriorating, many dam owners have been looking to see whether they can remove their dam um, effectively and safely um, and at a, a reasonable cost. And so what I wanted to share with you is some of the communities and organizations that have either removed a dam or in the, pro are in the process of planning to remove a dam. So on the left side of the slide, you see a list of dam owners that have either removed a dam or repaired a dam. I mean, um, or in the process of planning to remove a dam. So you'll see municipalities, for example, Beckett, uh, Plymouth, Andover. Um, Plymouth has removed a number of dams. You'll see some non-governmental organizations listed there um, that are pursuing dam removal. And then you'll also see some private companies that own dams that either have removed them already, such as HRD Press in Pelham, or are planning to remove the dam. And then on the right, you'll see a list of organizations that has been assisting with the dam removal process, either through technical assistance, um, by providing funding, or by managing the projects themselves, writing the grants, um, shepherding the permits through the permitting process, um, meeting with community members, and so on. So there's actually quite a large demand for dam removal in Massachusetts. And we've removed about 29 dams so far in partnership with dam owners. Um, every day, you know, every month, I get a new phone call from another dam owner who's interested in exploring dam removal. So the demand is very high. I'm going to talk now a little bit about how dams impact the riverine environment and then how removing a dam can restore the river environment. At the end, I'll just show you some photos of project sites so you can get a sense of what these sites look like, and then um, that'll be it. So a short presentation. So here is an example of a free-flowing river. So this is going to be kind of a little cartoon thing here. And the river is flowing from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. And the types of fish that live in rivers are fish that depend on free-flowing water. For example, eastern brook trout um, can only survive in free-flowing rivers. They're not able to live in impoundments uh, formed by dams. So here's our river fish. We'll pretend that these are eastern brook trout. When a dam is built and the water is ponded behind it, the river fish are no longer able to live there, and so um, they leave that habitat. And fish that need to swim upstream to get to different areas of the watershed, different areas of the stream network for spawning or rearing, um, are blocked by the dam. So they're trying to get upstream, and they can't get there. One of the impacts that dams have on rivers is that they impact the water quality. So the water in an impoundment, that's the pond formed by the dam, because that water is spread out, it tends to warm up uh, much more readily than river water does. And as that warm water is sort of spread across the surface of the impoundment, it then goes over the dam and becomes a source of thermal pollution um, downstream. So that's why that other fish is saying hot. The dam traps sediment. And often you get aquatic plants or algae growing up in the impoundment. As those decay, the decay process uses up dissolved oxygen. So the fish um, that rely on free-flowing rivers are no longer able to survive in the impoundment. And instead, you get fish that are adapted to poor water quality conditions. 
And when you multiply this effect times the 3,000 dams in Massachusetts, you can imagine that fish that rely on rivers such as eastern brook trout are really restricted to a small area um, of their former habitat. And then these are some of the fish and wildlife and other organisms that use rivers um, in Massachusetts. So one of the myths about dam removal is that when you remove a dam, you'll have a mud pit and that mud pit will exist into the future. In fact, what we've seen is that within a few months, um, the former impoundment greens up quite quickly. And I'll show you two more project examples. This is a dam removal project um, in southeastern Massachusetts. And this is what the site looked like about a month after the dam was removed. And then uh, this is another shot of the same thing. And now the next photo is going to be taken from the um, left side of the slide looking upstream so you can see what the former impoundment looked like the following summer. And so this is what it looks like when a ponded area is restored to a riverine um, environment. Further up in that same, um, same project site, this is another view of the impoundment further upstream from the shots I just showed you. This is what it looks like with the dam in. And this is what it looked like two years later once the dam had been removed. So it quickly returns to a free-flowing river. One more project I want to show you. Um, you're looking across a river, um, across the top of a dam. And then three months after the dam was removed, this is what the site looked like. And now, if you imagine yourself standing on that riverbank and you turn around to your right to look upstream to where the impoundment formed by the dam used to be, this is what you see. And so this is three months after the dam was removed. Those red flowers that you see are cardinal flowers. Uh, that's a native riparian plant in Massachusetts which has these beautiful red flowers to it. Um, just a quick word about sediment. There's often concerns that when you remove a dam that all the sediment will wash downstream. In fact, when you remove a dam, you let the water drain off slowly and let the water settle. And then the stream can either excavate a new channel, um, such as you see here. This, is, this by the way, is, is Lake Warner itself. Um, or sometimes that channel can be excavated using equipment. Um, but all the sediment does not wash downstream. It's allowed to settle and it becomes the new floodplain. Um, in that environment. When you think about the benefits of removing Lake Warner Dam, it actually ranks quite high in comparison to other dams in Massachusetts. And I just want to point in particular, you know, this is kind of a list of benefits, but the one in particular I want to mention is that if the dam were to be removed, it connects nearly 25 miles of main stem um, of the river itself and tributaries to the river with the Connecticut River downstream. And so it connects a whole lot of habitat for both migratory fish that come up from the ocean up the Connecticut River and native fish as well. So I guess my take home mes messages for you tonight then are that dam removal is, um, you know, it's, it's an accepted practice in Massachusetts that a dam owner may choose. We've removed around 29 dams so far in Massachusetts. Removing a dam restores the natural uh, riverine environment. And finally, there's a variety of resources that are available to dam owners that choose to remove dams and restore rivers. Um, I definitely encourage any of you that have questions, feel free to email me or call me at the office anytime you want. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Kristen DeBoer, I'm the Executive Director of Kestrel Land Trust and I'm glad to see a big turnout. Uh, just, can I have a raise of hands of who's been here since seven and, okay, and who did not hear the repair portion of this? Anybody? Okay, I just want to remind everyone why we're here tonight. Um, so Kestrel Land Trust, again, we are a, a regional land trust dedicated to farmland and woodland conservation. Uh, in 19 towns, we've been serving Hadley for the last couple decades, uh, particularly in farmland conservation. We merged last year with the Valley Land Fund, which acquired this dam in uh, the 1980s from the Boisvert family as part of a conservation deal on Mount Warner. Uh, when we merged with the with uh, Valley Land Fund, we put the dam in a limited liability corporation, which is sort of a box that limits liability, but we still have the responsibility 
of uh, figuring out the future of this dam right now as the owner. And in December, um, as a result of our phase one study, which we have to do every five years, uh, there was a, um, the result was that the dam was in poor condition and the state has now ordered us to repair or remove the dam by the end of 2014. So that's the problem we're here tonight to address with the town of Hadley because this is a public resource that we would like to really give the town the chance to take control of the situation by taking ownership of the dam um, this year if possible. So, that, so what I would like to do now is just go over uh, what we see are the possible funding options for either scenario uh, and then talk a little bit about the timeline. So um, based on our research of the funding options available, uh, we've identified three feasible uh, sources of funding for repair. One of them is the uh, new state dam bill that was just passed in 2012 and they're still developing a request for proposals but it's essentially a 17 million dollar pool of funding for both coastal waterways and inland dams. It's for repair or removal um, and we've also learned that municipalities who own dams may be higher on the list to receive funding um, but the whole process uh, you know brings to bear another source of funding that wasn't previously available for repair. So that is one source of funding that the, that the town could take advantage of if, if the town chooses to take ownership of the dam for repair. Um, the second source of funding, which we had discussed with, the Mass, with, the, with Hadley's Historic Commission earlier this year, um, is the Preservation Projects Fund. And this is particularly for historic structures, which this dam is because it's on the National Historic Register uh, we, we had looked at a quick application for that in March, but we don't have enough information yet to be eligible for funding. Um, and it does require a local match. And that's where uh, Hadley's own uh, Community Preservation Act comes in, um, because uh, as a historic structure, the restoration of the structure could qualify for CPA funds. Um, now, I, I do want to emphasize that <clears throat> as a land trust that works with Hadley on farmland conservation, uh, we use CPA and rely on that so often every year to leverage the APR program. Um, so we're definitely aware of competing funds. We're also aware that the town has other priorities pending um, for the restoration of historic buildings, uh, both in North Hadley and, and the center of town. So, um, but that is an option the community could seek for funding um, in order to leverage the state grants. And so. Uh, if you think of it as a percentage match, uh, the local funding can match the state funding. And on, on removal, there's um, a little bit more funding available as far as we are aware, uh, particularly from federal sources. Uh, the North, uh, the National, I'm never getting this right, NOAA, North, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, offers uh, funding and we have uh, put ourselves in the list with the Nature Conservancy to be eligible for funding if it should come up, but we will only accept that funding if the town chooses not to take ownership of the dam for repair. Um, the two other sources of funding are uh, the Mass Department of Tra Ecological Restoration themselves. Um, Beth, who is here tonight, uh, ex explained what their program is about, uh, as well as the Massachusetts Environmental Trust, which focuses on water quality, and that's um, license plate money, those special environmental license plates. So, those are three feasible sources. So I guess the point is that we have options. Uh, we want to be in this together with the town to help us figure this out. Um, and if the town wants to take ownership, there are options for both repair and removal to fund it. Uh, so no one has to do this alone. Uh, well, Kestrel is committing $25,000 for the uh, required phase two repair uh, initiative, but we do not have $300,000 to spend on, re on repair. So uh, state funding would be required uh, for either repair or removal. Right, so Kestrel um, has decided, the Board of Trustees has decided that ownership of the dam is not within our mission or capacity. Uh, so 
Kestrel's not going to be able to repair the dam and own it. Um, Kestrel. It was uh, part of the merger, and it's a responsibility that we're facing right now. So I, I, I think that's something we can address. I'd like to go into the timeline and then break into small groups. Uh, as far as the timeline is concerned, we've spent the last couple of months reaching out to town officials in Hadley. Uh, this is the first informational session we've had. We expect the dam report, the phase two report on repair to be finished in May. Uh, we intend to meet with the select board again in June about uh, the proposal for town meeting vote and CPA funds. Uh, we would have to meet with the Community Preservation Act on this issue. Um, and then if the town decides that they want to bring this to town meeting, there could be a vote on the matter in October. Um, and, and in November, if the, if the town decides to take ownership, the repair process could begin. Um, and if not, the choice that Kestrel has made at this point as the dam owner would be uh, to seek removal. So that is where we are. And what we'd like to do now is hand it back over to Sarah to facilitate the group discussion portion of this. Thank you. What we're going to do now is have each facilitator walk through quickly, pretty quickly, uh, what they came up with in their group. Imagine we'll find that they're all very similar, so we may only need to get to the first couple of groups and then we'll find that they're all pretty similar. And then what we're going to do, if, if people could, could uh, bring their attention forward, that would be great. And we'll see if we can wrap this up so everybody can be heading home for the evening. Thank you. Um, so each facilitator is going to present their groups uh, pros and cons for each option and I think they're going to be similar. What we'll do is um, go through those very quickly and then what I'm going to do is we'll, we'll sort of bring to, to the forefront that I think we'll, you know, we'll find what the, the repair pros are the same as the removal cons and all, you know, but we, we, we just want to make sure everybody feels like their thoughts were covered on uh, these options. As Kristen outlined, there's a lot more steps to be taken here. So we really wanted to just gather information, provide you with some information and gather some other information. So we'll present what we found. If, if you don't hear something here that, that you really needed to get out, we can, we can uh, hear that. But uh, pretty much at this point, we want to sort of wrap up with what we heard and the next steps. So uh, I'll start. Do I need the microphone or can I just yell? Oh, all right. oh great. So uh, we addressed repair first. So the repair pros, uh, the first comment was it's the heart and soul of Hadley. Uh, it's historic, recreational features, particularly summer and winter. Uh, the wetland habitat, the species that are already there that need to be protected. Water supply, it's uh, on a scenic byway. Uh, one of the most popular places in Hadley, I guess that sort of goes back to heart and soul. And uh, also the, the fact that it was a power source and that the repair of it would keep that potential future power source. Page two. Page two. The cons of repair that our group came up with were cost. Uh, the continued eutrophication of the lake, continued silting, which is very similar. Uh, and that's, that's what we came up with for cons to repair. So removal, the pros to removal, uh, flooding issues, cheaper, expanded recreation, meaning different types and, and areas, and different species of fish. As we saw from the video, you, you, you get some, some different types of uh, fish than you have now, there now. And removal cons, can you just, uh, the habitat species, uh, you're destroying the unique character of the historic landscape and the loss of the water supply in the lake. That was our group. You want, oh, and so we had a, a, then additional questions. Um, the most uh, important was who will own the land under the lake? 
So the issues of who would have the riparian rights to uh, the remainder of the land if the river uh, channel restored itself and who would maintain that land in the future, all sort of tied to the ownership issues of the, what's under the lake now. Do you want to hold your? Um, my, my group was a little more disorderly, wouldn't take any orders from me, so <laughs> what, what I've got is a list of concerns, um, and if I miss any, holler from the back, please. Um, repeat the concern about ownership of land under the impoundment. There may be some information available on that in terms of, of deed records, but we'll, we'll work on that. Um, town liability. if. Um, the town were to take the dam, what's that, what's that mean in terms of liability? Uh, a couple of comments about they thought Kestrel was going too fast and coming with the lack of full information. Um, parenthetically, I'd say th those are sort of opposite problems. We're, we're trying to go not too fast, but we're a little ahead of all the information just because we want to get the problem out and identified. Big problem in terms of no information on the lake restoration costs. Uh, I think people accept the no people accepted the notion that repairing the, the dam by itself doesn't restore Lake Warner, and so what, what's that mean? Um, had a couple suggestions that maybe Kestrel should just ignore the state and accept some fines. Um, th those those were not from lawyers. Um, had a question about why were you guys dumb enough to take the dam? I couldn't answer that. There was a comment, which is not entirely unfair, that the, that the film showed the Milwaukee River with folks boating and sailing and running ocean-going ships up and down, and that the Mill River probably isn't that. So, and I think that's true. I mean, it was, a, it was an example, but it's not a perfect example that was shown. Um, and I guess that's it. Did I miss any important ones? Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Jennifer Addis and my group came up with questions, not, we didn't go the pros and cons route. Um, the first question is, are any of these deadlines negotiable? Um, the Kestrel deadline, the October deadline, the October meeting. And that's related to another uh, question, which was, why has the CPA not been approached? Procedure has been broached by scheduling the May town meeting without talking to the CPA first. Um, this is more a request, was let's see some benefits and success stories of repair and restore scenarios. Um, another question, who owns the land under the lake? And if the lake is drained and is found to be polluted, who cleans it up? Who pays? Are there historical examples of what happens to drained land? How much is the lake currently used? I mean, everybody, it seems to be, is saying it's used a lot, but um, people in the group were wanting more, more than just that general sense, more specific information. Um, what surveys will be done to assess the archeological sites around the lake? Will there be surveys on endangered species and freshwater mussels in preparation for either option? What are the means of building community support and funding for repair of the dam and restoration of the lake? Okay, thank you. Can I make uh, one quick comment? The Hadley CPA is supporting uh, study work that's being done on the, the lake itself, on the condition of the water, and the uh, inventory of the plants. Uh, 
Okay, Pete Westover. Uh, we covered some of the same ground, and I thought our group was was pretty impartial. Uh, the clearly, uh, people are very much attached to the pond for a lot of reasons. You know, kayaking, fishing, ice fishing, and. Uh, historically uh, scenery, uh, but several people mentioned their concern that if you're going to fix the dam, it makes sense also to uh, fix the lake, basically. And I thought one idea was pretty good. Uh, UMass ought to take responsibility for the condition of the lake. Uh, stuff comes from, the, from up there. Uh, I, a few people said that they were impressed by the fact that on some of these other rivers, uh, things don't look so bad as, as they might have thought after you take a dam out. But on the other hand, it might take a lot of work to make it look that good. So that's not a given either. Um, I think that was pretty much it. Uh, oh, and there was a concern that uh, from one person that uh, uh, Kestrel keep its hand in and remain active in, in if the dam is repaired in helping to find the funds and helping to put together rather than wash its hands of the project. So that's where we were. Actually, that's an interesting question, and the university is dealing with Campus Pond right now because the Mill River comes into Campus Pond and runs out of it, but they've all determined that it's not a river, it's a pond, and the river just comes in and goes out again, but Campus Pond is not a river. It's, it's, it's a fascinating question. <laughs> <coughs> So the group I was with was full of energy and had a number of statements it wanted to make. It didn't want to get organized either. Um, there's a concern about the upstream, how narrow would that get um, from what it is now. It has uses for irrigation. Would that still be possible? Uh, what would it do to the underground water supply? And then again, the who will own the land underneath? Uh, who's responsible for fixing or disposing of unwanted crud that turns out to, to be found there? Um, landowners, it, this is all if removal. Landowners might be concerned about park visitors nearby. Is the flow consistent enough year round or is it adequate for a park or for some of the aesthetic pleasures that, that uh, have been implied by the film? So if there were restoration, what would it look like visually? This is what, what there's an interest in having a lot more information gathered and, and, and assembled so that a choice can be made. Visually, hydrologically, what would the land use be? Would it be a park? Uh, might it be agricultural use? And, and then the, the question about who owns was, was more specific. Does the Kestrel Trust, land trust, own, own the land under it? Do our butters do it? Or would the town do it? And obviously you, you need the clear answer to that question. And another timeline extension question. Does the town have the political will to take the responsibility of taking ownership and then disposing of it or repairing it? And then the last one is who is going to make this decision, is it the select board, select board or the town meeting? And, and since this would be a special town meeting, it presumably would require, if the select board don't agree to, to put it on a warrant, it needs 100 signatures.
think this might be the last one of our groups, yeah? Okay. Uh, so our group t focused a lot on questions, but in that process we touched on a lot of the same pros and cons that we've heard so far. Uh, overlapping questions, <clears throat> excuse me, were about the ownership under the impoundment of the lake again, <clears throat> related to the previous question on uh, does Kestrel own under the lake? I can clarify that quickly. Kestrel owns the dam structure itself, just the structure. And then we also own uh, an abutting piece of land, a peninsula up in the northeast corner of the lake. Uh, that's the extent of our ownership. Uh, the water level, if removed, um, there was a question about how that would change, the topography would change uh, in the lake area, upstream and downstream. And um, Beth Lambert can correct me if I misrepresent this, but essentially uh, what she stopped by and told us was that the, the between the inlet and the outlet, the water level would gradually drop between those two points, but the water uh, below the dam would not be changed and the water above the dam and, and the, and the uh, river would not be changed. There was a question that I haven't heard yet about are there alternatives for ownership besides the town? And our dam statement is worded such that there's room if there's another responsible entity such as another nonprofit that uh, was it within their mission to own and maintain a dam, they could step in and do that. Um, there was also questions about the lake health. I can also tell you in addition to the uh, f study funded by CPA, the Department of Fish and Game is into, uh, planning to do a survey of the fish populations in the lake this summer. And there was also another question about the impacts to the groundwater level and people that have wells around the lake. And with that, I think we're back to Sarah. Oh, all these tall people. So I think you all heard that each group um, had, there's a lot of common um, issues and concerns. Um, what I heard was you know, the historic significance, scenic significance, recreational use, habitat issues on, on both sides, water quality, water supply, quantity, uh, big questions where we need some more information, our ownership of both the riparian rights, the land under the lake currently, uh, the timing of this, it sounds like, is, is a particular question to people, uh, their comfort level with what the steps are and, and where we need to go from here. Um, just in terms of putting, you know, this uh, in into context, um, and maybe Kristen can address this if she likes. But what, um, as I said before, we're gathering information. These are a lot of good questions, but hearing from you all what uh, you're concerned about, what you think about, what the issues are, and your use of the lake, its significance to the community, and the dam itself and moving forward looking for realistic solutions in terms of who can own it, who, who can maintain it, and uh, what the future viability of, of the dam is, and then you know, what are the repercussions and issues facing removal. So um, at this point, I think what we'd like to do is, um, you know, if, if anybody has any compelling questions that weren't brought up, uh, we can do that briefly, but I think at this point we'd like to, uh, Kestrel is going to compile all this information, start moving forward in terms of talking again with the various um, committees and, and boards and community. As you saw in the timeline, there will be another community forum in probably September where we can you know, come back as a, you know, I heard it come up that maybe there wasn't an inf enough information at this time. Well, we'll have uh, the study from Morris in hand. We will have uh, much more information and we can get answers to some of these questions and come back and, um, and, and you know, report back what we've learned and, and maybe hear from you again at that time. Uh, is there a particular, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, there's a microphone right up here in front. If, that'd be great. You gave us numbers about repairing it to be three hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. Have you looked at trying to get any grants to repair it instead of the town Hadley fixing your problem for you? It's easy for you to say, oh, we'll just tear it up because you don't live there. 
I mean, how many of you Tesla people have actually gone on the lake and gone fishing, done anything down there? I mean, well, you're, so you're focusing more on either the town take it over or some other company or whatever to fix it, but we're, you're only focusing on tearing it down. It doesn't seem like you're spending any time to try to get grants to actually fix the thing. Well, um, I, and I, Christian can jump in if she likes it, but um, I, I think that at this point they have, um, they've pursued looking to the state, uh, Mass Historical Commission offers a historic preservation projects fund, uh, that's once a year. So um, we did inquire of Mass Historical Commission and uh, they have funded the repair of dams, so it was a viable project for them, but we didn't have enough information in hand to file for their, their April 1st deadline or March 30th, whatever it is. So, um, but it's certainly an eligible project for them because it's on an, in a national register district. Yep. So th that has been pursued. Um, and you know, so I, I think at this point, uh, what they're trying to get the community to understand is um, repair and long-term maintenance is not in their mission or within their financial resources. But there is an opportunity. We, you know, they have been in looking into that. Okay. Any, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to mention so. Um, we don't know what's going to happen, whether the dam's going to come down or stay. I think a lot of us would like to see it stay. We can't expect Kestrel to do all the research for all the possible funding and, and uh, engineering options or partnership options. So I just want to take the moment to say that there's a clipboard that's going around. I'll leave it by the door. There is a nonprofit that we set up in, in Hadley uh, last year, and uh, for good and bad reasons, we haven't done much yet. But uh, Kestrel deserves a partner in Hadley. They came to the select board a couple of months ago or more while I was on it and asked for there to be a warrant article to discuss this at least. And well, they were shut down by my board. I, mean, I didn't understand why. I said, yes, let's bring it to the people. So I almost don't blame them if they're saying, OK, we tried to work through the government in Hadley and uh, they didn't want to talk to us too much. So we set up a citizens group, maybe the right thing. So we'd love your participation. Not looking for money or anything yet. We're just looking for as big a team as we can put together of interested citizens in Hadley. I've been on the lake. I think it's beautiful. A lot of good reasons to keep the dam if we can. So I'm sorry I always talk too much. That's why I got kicked off the board. But uh, <laughs> if you care and you're interested, we're going to get a website set up in the next couple of weeks, I hope. Here's a sign up list right here. I'll leave it by the door. Um, we'll get you on the email list, and um, we're looking for, for membership. Um, working with the government in Hadley, uh, they're all busy people. So let's, let's do our part. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions for um, the experts who are, uh, or orchestral particularly, um, that came up in your group that maybe could be addressed by uh, Beth or Amy or Morris? Hi, um, uh, we were talking about um, what if there's some really bad things under the lake? Um, how much study is done or research is done on that to know what you might be liable for if you do decide to take the, the dam down? Hi, um, that's a really good question and a very common concern related to dam removal. So testing sediment um, underneath the impoundment is an important part of any dam removal project and it's done very early in the engineering and design process so that you know exactly what's in the sediment. And from there you can uh, make a decision on how to manage it during the project in a way that protects ecological health and human health. Um, I hope that it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a very detailed um, process. It's overseen by the state agencies through their permitting process and through the federal agencies um, also. Could it stop the uh, demolition of the dam if it's found that it's more hazardous to take the dam down for what's underneath the soil? It can be expensive to manage contaminated sediment, and so if that makes the project so expensive that it's beyond the capacity of funders and others to deal with, then, um, then yes, it can.
Anybody else? Um, yeah, I just had a question again about the restoration scenario, right? We're looking at two different scenarios. We have pretty clear information, or we will have clear information about the costs, and what's going to look like visually, what's going to change or not change if we repair. On the restoration side, we've seen scenarios which admittedly are, uh, you know, not comparable. To what extent they're comparable, we don't know. So I, I guess I have two questions. One is, at the next meeting or when the town does have to make a decision, will there be more information on the other scenario that's, specific, that's site specific and cost specific? And uh, the other uh, question is, I guess, um, related to that, are there examples in Massachusetts or in New England of sites that are, you know, roughly comparable in terms of topography and whatnot that have been restored so people can, you know, leaving aside who owns it and what additional is invested in it so that at least people have a sense of what the alternative scenario is because otherwise we're making a decision based on uh, an unknown and a known and, um, you know, so I think when a decision has to be made to make an informed decision one way or the other, you know, we need to be looking at apples and apples in terms of the amount of information we have as much as possible. Uh, yes, I would agree. I think, I think our, our charge ahead is to get as much information as possible to help the town make an informed decision. Um, the phase two report for repair will definitely have a better estimate than we saw tonight of 300 to 500,000. Um, as far as restoring the lake, I think the Friends of Lake Warner's study that uh, is looking at the, the, the issues facing the lake at least may help inform that decision as well and I believe that study is underway. Um, so the answer is we will do our best to have the cost of removal. Um, restoration after removal. Yeah. Um, well, you know, our, our feeling was that we wanted to give Hadley a good year to take the, 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 have the chance to take control of the situation for repair, and so we were focusing on cost estimates for repair first. Um, if in October, if the town decides not to take ownership of the dam for repair, then the removal cost would be more fleshed out then, and, and you know, we'd have a long process ahead of us, obviously. Andy Morris, Rubin, 45 Roosevelt Street. Uh, let me try to stick to three quick points. Um, I guess everybody would think it would be nice if a third party would step in and solve this problem for us, or if Kestra would just keep the dam, or something like that. But that's probably not going to happen. If we decide we want to save Lake Warner, then we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to step up and take the responsibility for it. Um, as a town, as a community. Uh, that brings me to, oh, uh, so thank you for coming today. And if you have comments or questions, you can write them down and send them to Kestrel and they'll put them in the report. Because um, it's our decision. Um, that brings me to my second point. Whose decision is it? Is it the select board's decision? Or should it be town meeting's decision? Should five people get to decide the future of Lake Warner? Or should everybody get to decide the future of Lake Warner? And I think that this is something that needs to be discussed and voted on in town meeting, uh, something that's this important. Uh, I kayak in Lake Warner every week in the summer. I ride my bicycle there almost every day. I love that lake. It's a jewel and a treasure. I would hate to lose it. Um, uh, but we're going to have to save it if it's, if it's going to be saved. Um, and I had a third point, but you know, I just forgot what it was. So maybe it'll come back to me. So I just want to make a comment about like who owns the water or who owns the land underneath the water. So when we bought this in 1970, I got this old deed. And of course, this can be a question for your lawyers for sure. But in our deed, it said also the water and mill privileges with all that may belong and go with same, either the flowage rights of or ownership of land covered by the water as it has been used for about 250 years. We always thought we owned the land underneath the water. And so when we sold it to the Valley Land Trust, by the way, we had the inspection in 1985, 
and the dam inspection, and they gave us one year to fix it, which is why we ended up selling it to the valley. Uh, Terry Blunt was really great. He was gonna, he had all kind, you know, he had a lot of nice ideas. But we, when we sold it, we assumed that when the, when the Valley Land Trust bought it, they bought the land underneath the water. But it, there's deeds that you can take a look at. Thank you. Anybody else? Several times I've heard this described as a partnership, yet um, unless some outside grant money comes in for re uh, repair of the dam, the proposal is that the town assumes 100% of the cost. So in the spirit of partnership, I'd like to ask Kestrel to consider upping that percentage from zero to somewhere between zero, or between zero and 100, I guess. That would be indicative of an effort at partnership. Did you remember your third point? Yeah. I remembered number three, thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm still Andy Morris reading that. Um, I feel like our town's historical heritage is slipping through our fingers. We're selling our town buildings. We're getting rid of Lake Warner. We're not expanding the historic district. All the things that make Hadley so special, such a wonderful community, are being taken away from us because we don't want to pay for them. Well, once we lose these assets, they are gone forever. And no amount of money is going to be able to bring them back. I mean, is this really what we want? I don't think so. Anybody else? Great. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight and participating and giving us your thoughts. We appreciate it. Thanks. Have a good evening.